between 19... Talk is money, honey. All we talk is money. All we talk is money. It's like bees to the honey. Honey, money, honey, money, honey. It's the sauce cast, baby. Welcome everybody at home. My name is Adam Sosnick. Uh, welcome to the sauce cast. Today's gonna be a different type of episode. Um, typically we talk culture, current events, dating, relationships, money, but today's gonna be a little serious. Uh, we are talking Israel and Hamas. Um, uh, on this program, I typically avoid these types of subjects uh, just because it's not what this show is about. Uh, but today, we're going to address it. Now, if you're a fan of the PBD podcast, um, we address these types of topics all the time. PBD podcast, one of the biggest podcasts in the world. I've been PBD's co-host since day one, and it's, um, it's been enlightening. Um, you guys good over there? Okay. We're already, people are already fighting about this internally, but um, it's fine. Welcome to uh, show business. So, but today, uh, we're going to address what's going on. The reason that I'm covering this episode today is because this week, this actual day yesterday, marked the sixth month anniversary of the ongoing conflict war between Israel and the IDF and um, Gaza and Hamas. So let me address a couple things up front, just so everyone knows where I stand. Uh, up front, I'm about to eight mile Eminem this thing. Um, I am pro-America. I am pro-Israel. I am a Zionist. I believe that Israel has a right to exist. I also believe that the people of Gaza, the people of Palestine, have a right to life and a right to have human dignity. And it's something that we're all grappling with at this point. So I'm inviting you to make the most negative comments ever. Call me a Jew. Call for my death. I don't care. It is what it is. Um, I believe in certain things, and I'm going to say them. That is the power of the First Amendment and the free speech. Now, I'm also going to say some things that are going to upset some Jewish friends of mine. Because I don't think that anyone is 100% right. And I don't think that anybody is 100% evil. And to position this thing in a binary option where it's good versus evil and it's, it's the, um, the people who are doing right versus the people who are doing evil is incorrect. I think it's a horrible way to frame things. I think there's, it's all about perspective. It's all about nuance. And there's a wide spectrum of things that are going on there. So 
I'm addressing this up front so the haters can come out of the woodworks now so they know where we stand. I'm going to piss off some Palestinians. I'm going to piss off some Jews. But that's fine because the one thing that I'm looking for is the truth, Veritas. Harvard, the slogan of Harvard is Veritas. We all seen what's going on in Harvard, how they've lost their way. They were the wokest school in the country. Not my opinion, fact. You can fact check it. No one had a worse freedom of speech platform than Harvard. So here's what we're going to be doing today. In three major topics, there's, a, there's something called the rule of threes, and I'm just going to give it to you one by one. One, two, three. Number one, we're going to talk about the conflict and the ceasefire that's going on, uh, or potential ceasefire and ceasefire talks that are going on today. That's number one. Number two, we're going to be talking about what I always say, follow the money, FTM, follow the money. How money has played a major factor in this conflict, in the region, and in the world. We all know that. And number three, possibly the most important, because we are in America. How this affects America, how this affects the 2024 election, how Biden is balancing this, how Trump is balancing this, how the Democrats are positioning themselves, how the Republicans are positioning themselves, and the most important state in the union for this topic has become Michigan, which is where my father was born, which is where my family was from, born and raised in Miami, but I spent a lot of time in Michigan. I have very orthodox Jewish family in Michigan. I also have, you ready for it? Arab friends in Michigan. I also have Arab friends around the world. I was just with my Saudi friends at the Live Golf Tournament having this discussion this weekend. Um, one of the things I always say is some of my favorite people in the world are Jews. I also say some of my least favorite people in the world are Jews. I say, and that, by the way, that goes for everything. Some of my favorite people in the world are Mexicans. Some of my least favorite people in the world are Mexicans. So my favorite people in the world are Chinese, least favorite are Chinese, Arabs, Muslims, Christians, Jews. We are all individuals. Um, I'll say one more thing before we get started on these details. Um, you can criticize, you can't criticize someone's religion. You have the right to be Jewish. You have the right to be Catholic. You have the right to be Christian. You have the right to be Muslim. You have the right to be Buddhist, Hindu. You go down the list. Um, that is a religion. It is what it is. Number two, um, the type of people that follow these re religions, um, you have no right to criticize the people and what they believe. This is their culture. This is what they stand for. This is how they were raised. Um, I do not stand for um, villainizing a religion or villainizing a type of people. What I will say that no one is immune from, including Israel, including the United States, the country I was born from and the country that Jews live in, everyone should be open to criticism. No one is perfect. No one walks on water except for potentially Jesus. Shout out to my Christian friends watching this. Um, everyone should be, have the ability to be criticized. So with that being said, um, I wanted to give you this uh, deep disclaimer of what we're doing today. I encourage you, let me know how you feel in the chat. Talk your shit. Support me. Tell me to go to hell. Tell me I'm the man. I don't care. I'm searching for the truth, and I want to deliver, deliver that to you. So um, with the help of my friend Humberto on the ones and twos, we are going to try to solve this problem. I say this all the time. You can be pro-Israel, but also Palestinian, pro-Palestinian at the same time. I believe that Palestinians should be freed from the terror group known as Hamas. Bring it up. Um, I'm also a Zionist. I believe in the right for Israel to exist and the right for Israel to be a country. Um, where this starts. Today, uh, is it today or tomorrow is the end of Ramadan? Tomorrow is the end okay, of Ramadan. Okay, tomorrow is the end of Ramadan. And um, I was just with Saudi friends of mine. They were fasting. Um, some, not so much. They were drinking. I won't, I won't say names. Um, very holy day. Um, and that's where the story sort of kicks off. We all know what happened on October 7th. On October, on October 6th, 2023, there was a ceasefire in place. Hamas broke the ceasefire. October 7th, 1,200 people were slaughtered in Israel. 
240 hostages were taken. It was the deadliest attack on Jews since the Holocaust. That was in the 1940s, 1941 to basically 1945. Uh, Israel uh, got a state in 1948. Obviously contentious. Obviously major issues with land major issues with who has the right to the land. That's not what we're covering today. Um, what I do know is this. On October 8th, the next day, sorry, on October 7th, we did a PBD podcast. It was PBD, myself, um, Tim Cast, Jimmy Dore, and it was breaking news. Nobody had a clue what was going on. I was following the story, and I gave my perspective. What I did not expect after... 1,200 people were murdered, 240 hostages were taken, was for certain people around the world to rejoice and condemn Israel after 1,200 people were slaughtered. Um, they were praising Hamas, shocking to say the least, but if you've ever dealt with um, Jewish hate, if you have ever studied the Holocaust, these types of things rear their ugly heads from time to time, and something like this permeated deep down below and resurfaced on October 7th, on October 8th, before Israel fired a single bullet, people around the, around the world rejoiced, and it was a reckoning for many people, for many Jews, for many like-minded individuals, for many people that believe that Israel has a light to, uh, the right to exist and to defend themselves. It was pretty shocking and pretty breathtaking. Since that day, uh, it's been a six-month ongoing conflict. We all know about it. We don't need to relitigate that. Hamas has been fighting... Um, against the IDF. People think that it's just the IDF going around killing people. Hamas is fighting back. Hamas is still firing missiles into civilian areas in Israel. Um, you know how they say it takes two to tango? Israel is not just going around raping and pillaging and killing. They are fighting Hamas. They are hunting down Hamas. And yes, innocent civilians have been killed and it is fucking tragic. But welcome to war. This is what happens. I wish that we could have world peace. I wish that people could live together. I wish that that was a realistic perspective. It's just unfortunately not. So Israel, luckily enough, has something called the Iron Dome. Um, there has been funding from the U.S. We'll have a conversation about isolationism and interventionalism, what's going on, a conversation in the United States today. Um, but this war is ongoing. That leads me to where we will start the bulk of this episode, the current negotiation talks. Everyone's calling for a ceasefire now. Everyone's calling for stopping of the fighting. I will remind you, there was a ceasefire on October 6th. Hamas broke the ceasefire. That's just fact. Um, when you have a ceasefire, what's happening right now is that there are demands and there are negotiations. Um, Israel and Hamas have both sent their teams to Egypt um, to have talks with potential peace brokers, the Egyptian government, and also the Qatari government. We all know that Qatar, which we'll talk about in a second, is houses Hamas. The, Ham the Palestinian people are poor. We'll talk about that as well. While the Hamas leadership are literal billionaires flying around in private jets. Um, so Israel, Hamas are in Egypt, in Cairo, I believe, speaking with Egyptian officials, Qatari mediators, and uh, the director of the CIA, William Burns, as well as Secretary of State of the United States, Antony Blinken. The ball is in Hamas's court. There's an article that we're going to show you right now. Um, the, the ball is in Hamas's court, and it urges militants to accept the latest ceasefire plan. Quote, unquote, this is from Benjamin Netanyahu, like him or not, he's the longest standing Israeli prime minister ever. I believe he's on his sixth term. It's contentious and it is ugly and that is politics. Welcome to that. He is part of the Likud party, he's a right wing coalition. And if you know anything about right wingers, they take a pretty hard line stance on a lot of issues. That is Bibi Netanyahu's coalition. But Israel has demands and Hamas has demands and here's what they are. Netanyahu, he said the following, we're constantly working to achieve our goals. First and foremost, the release of hostages. So that's number one. People are asking for a ceasefire. Israel is saying, give us our hostages back and we will stop trying to kill Hamas. That's number one. He says the release of our hostages and achieving a complete victory over Hamas 
Don't get it twisted. They want to annihilate Hamas. This is war. Um, the victory requires every requires entry into Rafah and the elimination of terrorist battalions there. It will happen, and there is a date. Let me explain this. Started in Gaza City. They worked their way down. They had people of Gaza move south, move south, move south to Rafah. Rafa is along the Egyptian border. There's apparently approximately over a million refugees who have been displaced um, from all over Gaza, and they're, they're saddled into Rafa. And the whole conversation is, how can you, Israel, go into a Rafa to eliminate Hamas when there's a million civilians there? Legitimate questions. By the way, do you have an uh, image or a picture or video of the Rafa crossing border along Egypt. Do you have that? I believe I sent you that, if mm -hmm. you can show that. So people say, why doesn't Egypt just let them in? Why is Israel being so cold and callous? Egypt, you're their, our Arab brethren. Let them in for safety. Uh, we're going to show you what this wall along Egypt looks like. You know, we've had a whole conversation in the United States for the last, I don't know, eight years about build the wall. Uh, we've learned that walls are racist, according to uh, many people that don't support Donald Trump. Um, walls are racist. Uh, I'm going to show you this image of the wall separating Egypt from uh, Gaza, and you'll let me know what you think about this wall. This is the wall that separates Gaza from Egypt. This, this wall was built by Egyptians for one reason, to keep Palestinians out. So for people saying that Israel is doing certain things, out. they're the ones building walls, they're leaving is, uh, Gazans, Palestinians in an open-air prison, um, so is Egypt. Uh, do we have a video as well? Don't worry about that. That's the image. So he says there is a date to go into Rafah. Very, very controversial. The IDF general chief of staff, his name is Hurtsi Halavi. He says the following, we will not leave any brigades active in any part of Gaza Strip. He is talking about Hamas. Again, they're aiming to eliminate Hamas. Bibi Netanyahu said the following, Israel is ready for a deal. Israel is not ready to surrender. So Israel is willing to do a deal, but on the, on the, the paramount, the, the number one priority is getting their hostages back. I'll try to make this relevant. Uh, Israel views their citizenry, citizenry as their children, just like every country should. Um, if someone stole your kids, your children, from you, a terror organization, what would you do to get your kids back? Ask yourself that question. I'm not talking about Israel. I'm not talking about Hamas. I'm not talking about the Arab world. I'm not talking about America. I'm talking about you and your family. If someone held your kids hostage, what would you do to get your kids back? I'm assuming the answer is anything needed. That is what Israel is doing in trying to eliminate Hamas. Um, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, he weighed in on the current negotiations and the current peace arrangement, what's going on, uh, ceasefire, what's going on in Egypt right now. He said the following. Again, this is the um, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken of the United States. The latest proposal is very serious and should be accepted by Hamas. Exclamation point. The fact that Hamas continues to say no is a reflection of what it really thinks about the people of Gaza, which is not much at all. The ball is in Hamas's court, and the world is watching to see what it does. Again, I will remind you, this is Secretary of State Antony Blinken coming out and saying Hamas does not care about their people. Um, we all know the following. They use their people as human shields. They embed themselves into civilian populations. They hide in hospitals, in schools, in playgrounds, in mosques. In any civilian society, how do you eliminate somebody that's embedding themselves with families, with children, in schools, in playgrounds, in mosques, and in hospitals? Very hard to do. And Israel does deserve criticism for not being uh, precise um, in their attacks on Hamas. Um, bombing, uh, you're going to have some innocent victims. Uh, you're going to have collateral, da <coughs> collateral damage. As you guys see, I'm getting choked up over here. <coughs> 
Should you be using a sniper? Should you be using a bomb? <clears throat> what should you be using? Legitimate questions. But at the end of the day, you know, there's a famous line, you don't negotiate with terrorists. Israel is negotiating with terrorists. Hard to do. Um, <clears throat> continue to say this. Hamas wants dead people for PR. It does not care about civilians. Quote, unquote, the deader, the better. Um, <clears throat> Humberto, take it away. What are your thoughts on what I just said? <clears throat> you don't negotiate with terrorists. That's what it is. Um, personally, uh, I mean, as a Christian, you know, I'm always concerned of uh, what's going on in the Middle East. I grew up in the Middle East. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and terrorism is not only a problem in Israel. Uh, it's a problem in Saudi Arabia. It's a yes. problem in Dubai. It's a problem uh, all over the region. It's a problem here in America. And um, and terrorists, mm -hmm. by definition, they just want to uh, scare people into another lifestyle, yep. and um, you, you you don't you don't you don't get to um, you know to help because he, he's, they're not holding just the right. hostages hostage, they're holding the whole world hostage wow. until this is resolved. Well said, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Uh, he commented on the deadly famine that is occurring in Gaza. Uh, there is a humanitarian crisis, and it is horrible and it's tragic. People are left without few, food, without medicine, without shelter. Um, a lot of people will say this is Israel's fault. A lot of people will say this is Hamas's fault. What was Hamas expecting to happen after they attacked Israel? Uh, Trump has famously said, you punch me, I'll punch back ten times harder. Clearly this is how Israel and the IDF operate. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin continued to say, we are doing everything we can to encourage Israel to allow more humanitarian aid into Gaza. They've allowed, I think, 400 trucks um, every day with food, aid, assistance, nutrition, medicine um, into Gaza. It's not enough, though. I'm going to get some tea. Thank you, brother. It's all good. You're a human. Thank you, buddy. Um, <clears throat> that's Israel's proposal. Give us our civilians back. We want Hamas. We will stop the bloodshed. Again, they are at war. Hamas, they actually, you know, they say it takes two to tango. You need to have, um, uh, in order to have peace, you need to have a viable peace partner. This is what Hamas had to say. Uh, they were requesting that the, that the displaced civilians return to North Gaza, along with the release of 900 prisoners, 100 of which are serving life sentences for murder. So they, th here's what's happening. They want innocent people who have been held hostage um, to be returned to Israel. Meanwhile, Hamas wants 900 people who are in prison, 100 who are serving life sentences for murder to be released. Is that equal? Is that proportionate? I'll let you be the judge of that. So you have civilians for prisoners. Um, there you go with that. Uh, a Palestinian official said the following, that they are deadlocked, continue, will continue over Israel's refusal to end the war. Again, the refusal to end the war hinges on one thing, the hostages, guys, the hostages. Um, the withdrawal from Gaza will allow civilians to return to their homes and lift a 17-year-old blockade, allowing reconstruction. Um, have you seen images of Gaza? It's disgusting. It's horrible. What did you expect to happen, Hamas? Um, Hamas... Um, said the following, these steps took precedence over Israel's prime demand for release of hostages in exchange for Palestinians held in Israeli prison. So there you go, guys. Uh, it's a hostage negotiation. Um, uh, people are calling for the ceasefire. So my friends who are calling for a ceasefire, in order for the ceasefire to happen, hostages must be released and exchanged on both sides. So that's what they're waiting on. So to conclude this, little segment right here. Israel's goal is to eliminate Hamas. It's been going on for six months, but how close are they to eliminating Hamas? Well, I'll tell you. Um, if you believe the numbers uh, on either side, here are the numbers. Hamas claims that 33,000 people have died and a majority are women and children. 75,000 have been injured. One million have been displaced. Um, Israel claims that of the 33,000, 13,000 of them were fighters. So that is a two-to-one ratio between fighters and civilians. You can fact-check this in any war. If you can have a two-to-one ratio between civilians 
and fighters, you are doing a good job. Many wars have three, four, five, ten to one. War is horrible. It's disgusting. Um, Israel, as they say, does everything they can to prevent civilian casualties. They will do roof knocks. They will do drop leaflets. They will give heads up. They will alert civilians. Get out of the way we are coming. The people of Gaza know what this is. Uh, they also send text messages. Meanwhile, leader of Hamas in Gaza, Yahya Sinwar, still, be, still believed to be alive, hiding in one of the terror tunnels that they've built. Um, the situation is dire. There's not enough food. There's not enough medicine. There's not enough housing to meet the, the needs of the desperate population of Gaza. I say this with complete empathy. I pray that the hostages are returned. I pray that Israel gets what they want and they stop the bloodshed and let the people of Gaza survive. If, if you believe Bibi, and I take him at his word, Bibi Netanyahu, Israel is not stopping until they get their hostages back. You can agree with that. You can disagree with that. Those are his words. Um, moving right along. You know, they say follow the money, okay? Um, we had a conversation on the Peabody podcast um, in January with um, our friend, Bassem Youssef. Uh, it was contentious. It was disagreeable. Uh, we argued. We agreed on some certain things. Um, we, we yelled. We listened. We, um, we did that for two hours. I think we did a two-hour podcast. Peabody said that, uh, Vinny and himself probably spoke for 10 minutes. Bassem Youssef and I were speaking for um, 90% of the podcast. At the end of the podcast, after arguing, I said the following. Bassem, uh, at the end of the podcast, I'm going to shake your hand and I'm going to give you a hug. Because you're not my enemy. I'm not your enemy. You're Egyptian. Uh, your wife is Palestinian. I'm American. I'm a proud American. I'm Jewish. I have a uh, family that lives in Israel. I have family that have served in the IDF. But I am America first. I don't speak Hebrew. Um, I was born mitzvahed. I go to Israel. I've been there um, three times. Um, I don't speak the language. It is not my culture. It is not my people, so to speak. I'm American. Um, but at the same time, I defend Israel. I'm a proud Zionist. So, um, But what the conversation that I had with Bassem was... Bassem, let's not be emotional. Let's not, I'm not crying. I'm actually snotting over here, guys. Um, uh, clearly, I'm uh, losing my voice and I'm a little under the weather, but the show must go on. Um, I said, Bassem, I want to give you data. Uh, I don't want to just have a conversation about opinions. I want to give you data. So I said, I want to focus on two data points um, that you and I can discuss. Uh, number one is gross domestic product per capita, GDP per capita, and number two is unemployment. Because I believe that capitalism lifts people out of poverty, and socialism and Marxism and collectivism and authoritarianism keeps people in poverty and keeps people poor. Um, so I said, I want to go over some numbers with you. He proceeded to say that some of my data was racist. I said, what's racist about the data? He said, well, your undertone is racist. I sarcastically said, I'm sorry that I seem uh, to have a sarcastic undertone, but as they famously say, facts don't care about your feelings, and the proof is in the pudding, and show me the money. Shout out to Jerry Maguire. So I want to show you guys some of the numbers I was talking with with Bassem Youssef. We're going to follow the money. So GDP per capita, if you're not familiar with GDP, gross domestic product, uh, gross, domestic, gross domestic product is basically... Two things. What are the total goods and services that a country produces? And you divide that by the population. So um, the richest country in the world per capita, if you can punch in on that, is Monaco, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, what, is the, what does the average person make a year in Monaco? Uh, $240,000. Okay. That is the Jeez. average person in Monaco, the richest country in the world per capita. I'm going to throw some countries your way. You're going to sc scroll down until you see them. Number nine on this list, uh, the richest Arab country in the region is Qatar. Qatar, again, this is where uh, a lot of people believe that 
Hamas are hiding out. A lot of the reason that Hamas has funding is from two countries. Number one, Iran. You know, they say that Iran is the head of the snake. I actually disagree. I think it's the uh, head of the octopus. Because if you cut off a snake, it dies. Uh, an octopus, if you cut off one of its arms, it still has seven other arms and tentacles reaching elsewhere. So uh, Iran funds terrorism all around the globe. They um, fund Hamas. They fund the Houthis in Yemen. They fund Hezbollah in Lebanon. Um, they are the chief terrorist regime around the world. They are social pariah. Um, and we need to cut off at least one of the arms of the octopus. Uh, the ironic thing is that the Persian people who are held captive to Iran are great uh, individuals. I know one. I work for one. His name is PBD. Um, I pray for the day that the Iranians don't have to. Um, the Iranian people can be freed from Iran. Anyway, uh, I bring that up to say Iran and Qatar are funding a lot of the terrorism you're seeing. But Qatar is a very rich country. Number nine in the world on GDP per capita. By the way, going down the list, number 12 on this list is the United States of America, $76,000 per capita. You see the United States there? Okay. Uh, number 23 on this list is Israel, $54,000 per capita per person. Number 24 is the UAE, another country in the region, UAE. Uh, if you're not following along, um, many Arab countries are wealthy. Many Arab countries don't have terrorism problems. Many um, Arab countries are not dealing with extremist groups or jihadi groups or calling for the death of America or Israel. Certain countries do. It's usually the poorer countries. We'll get there. The UK at number 31, uh, GDP per capita, $46,000. Kuwait, another country in the Arab region, GDP, 41000 Saudi Arabia, shout out to my Saudi friends who just put on the Live Golf event. Awesome guys, awesome guys. Um, 30000 per capita. This list is going to change dramatically moving forward. Deep down the list is China. You know the average GDP per capita in China? They're the second biggest economy in the world. Uh, GDP per capita, $12,000 in China. That's how much the average Chinese person makes a year. So... The average American, the two biggest economies in the world by GDP, United States, number one, uh, China, sort of a distant second, um, catching up. But if you do GDP per capita, it's not even close. Um, moving right along, the people of Mexico, GDP per capita, make the same amount as China, about $1,000 less, $11,000. Colombia, uh, and now we're going to go rapid fire. The following countries, the average person makes five to $6,000 a year. Uh, Colombia. South Africa, Jamaica, Iraq, El Salvador. Shout out to uh, Nayib Bukele, what he's doing there in El Salvador. Um, then we're going to get into countries where the average person makes under $5,000 a year. Iran, Ukraine, Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, the West Bank and Gaza at $3,700 a year. Okay. Um, Ukraine, Jordan, Egypt, Lebanon, West Bank, Gaza, $3,700 a year. Continuing on, um, India, the average person in India, you know how much they make? $3,000 a year. Massive, massive country, largest population in the world. I think I believe they recently surpassed China, um, 1.5 billion people. I think China has 1.3. Their population is younger and growing. Chinese population aging and declining. Uh, Haiti, Haiti, if you see what's going on in Haiti these days, there's a civil war brewing right now. The average person makes $2,000 a year. Ethiopia, $1,000 a year. And the bottom three in this particular list, imagine living in the following countries in the Middle East. Yemen, there's a civil war raging in Yemen. It's a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, the average person in Yemen makes $650, $650 a year. Syria. Um, half a million people died in Syria this decade. Tens of thousands of people have died in Yemen. It might even be hundreds of thousands. Fact check me. Uh, the average person in Syria makes $420 a year. Um, lowest on the list, Afghanistan. 
the average person in Afghanistan makes $355 a year. Um, deep, deep poverty, deep, deep discontent. So you have countries like Qatar, you have countries like Israel in the Middle East, you have countries like the UAE, you have countries like Kuwait, uh, you have countries like Saudi, doing great. All these people are making money. You don't see a lot of terrorism there. Yemen, Syria, Afghanistan, Gaza, Lebanon, Jordan. Uh, these people are making under four or $5,000 a year. That's where you see a lot of terrorism. That's where you see a lot of issues that are being had. Um, unemployment rates, let's focus on this, rapid fire. The highest in the world, if you can pull this up, South Africa, 30%. Absolute disaster what happened in South Africa since Nelson Mandela. You have that thing you can pull up? Uh, absolute disaster. South Africa was treaded, uh, trending in the right direction. It is completely reverse course. It is an absolute disaster what is going on in South Africa. South Africa, by the way, was the country that was calling for uh, genocide against Israel um, uh, at the UN, uh, which the UN um, said they are not, uh, again, at the Hague, to be clear. Palestine, 25%. You see that? 25% unemployment. Haiti, Afghanistan. Haiti has a higher unemployment rate. Afghanistan has a, high, a lower unemployment rate than Palestine. Iran, 11%. Ukraine, 10%. Saudi Arabia, 5.5%. By the way, here in the United States, USA, UK, 3.6%. Israel, 3.5%. UAA, 2.8%. Qatar, lowest in the world 0.1%. What's my point of showing you the money? What's my point of showing you the numbers? Follow the money. Imagine being a 20-year-old guy in Gaza. Imagine being a 20-year-old guy in Yemen, the Houthis. Imagine being a 20-year-old guy in Syria. Imagine being a 20-year-old guy in Afghanistan. Okay? You've got no job. You have no money. You have no prospects. Um, your country is broke. Your people are poor. Um, you have no meaning. You have no purpose. I believe firmly that work it gives you purpose and meaning to your life. Um, you get recruited by an extremist group. Call it Hamas. Call it the Houthis. Call it Hezbollah. Call it the Taliban. They tell you death to America. They tell you death to Israel. They tell you death to the infidel. Um, they will pay you and pay your family. There's a process called pay for slay. Uh, you will be a martyr. You will go down in history. You will practice jihad. What else are you going to do in that situation? I'll give you one example. I'll give you the answer. And the answer is boom. Uh, you commit suicide. You will take people with you. You will do whatever you need to do because you have no job. You have no money. You've been indoctrinated to a firm belief. And you get paid for it. And you go down for a here as a hero and a martyr. What else would you do in their position? I empathize with those people. This is why GDP needs to be the sole focus of many of these countries, just like many countries are doing in the Middle East, not GDT, gross domestic terrorism. Continuing, Israel has now become the Silicon Valley of the Middle East. They, GDP per capita, um, other than Qatar, richest in the world, in the region, they are focused on economic growth, they are doing peace deals, all around the region. Uh, a lot of people believe that on October 7th it happened because they were very close to having a peace deal with Saudi Arabia. Everyone realizes that Israel is not the problem in the region. The, 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 the problem in the region is one country and one country only, and that is Iran. Iran is the Shiite uh, state, uh, biggest state in the region. Saudi Arabia is the uh, Sunni state, biggest state in the region, is the Mecca. Um, and... Um, a lot of people acknowledge that it is Iran that needs to be dealt with. By the way, if you want to follow the money, the United States, where do they come into this? The United States has given $130 billion worth of aid to Israel since their founding in 1948. Um, that was after World War II and the Holocaust. If you break that down, that is over 76 years. That is $1.7 billion a year. In 2023, the U.S. sent $3.8 billion in military assistance for Israel to buy weapons. Um, after the Hamas attacks... The Biden administration requests an additional $14 billion in military aid. By the way, you can pull this up. There's a stat. You might say, all right, well, how much money are they giving to Gaza? Who gives to Gaza? Well, the number one country that funds the Palestinians, drum roll please, is the United States. The United States leads the league 
in funding the Palestinians. You can show that. Aid to Palestine has totaled $40 billion um, since 1992. They've spent all their money not on GDP, but on GDT. They spent all that money on bullets, bombs, and terror tunnels. I ask you, what else should be done if you're spending your money on this? Moving right there, it is right there. List of the countries. No, there's, a, there's another stat right there. Okay. We got to wrap up in the next five minutes. But let me explain something. What's going to happen here in America is the following. Uh, we have an election in 2024. Uh, things are about to get very contentious. And the number one state, the tip of the spear, is a state called Michigan. I let off with that. That's where my dad's from, my family's from. There was recently a um, protest in Michigan. I want to show you this video, and I want to show you what's happening right now. So... Um, there they are. There's Muslim protests. They're chanting death to America. They're chanting death to Israel in Michigan. These are American citizens calling for the death of America. Uh, this is happening in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, the Wall Street, Journal, Wall Street Journal has coined Dearborn, Michigan, America's jihad capital. Here's the video right there. Go ahead. Go ahead, play that. It's fun. Anyway, um, the person that's going to be speaking in this clip, um, this was after Al Quds Day, it was a day event where he said that death to Israel has become the most logical chant shouted across the world today. Um, you, you can play the clip. Yeah. Okay, go for it. Almost done. Almost done. All right. In the past. Why are our protests on the International Day of Quds, why are they so anti-America? Why don't we just focus more on Israel and not talk so much about America? Do it on 1.5. Gaza has shown the entire world why these protests are so anti-America. Because it's the United States government that provides the funds for all of the atrocities that we just heard about. And this is why Imam Khomeini, who declared the International Day of Quds, this is why he would say to pour all of your cha all of your chants and all of your shouts upon the head of America. <laughs> Malcolm X said, and I quote. We live in one of the rottenest countries that, have ever, that has ever existed on this earth. It's not Genocide Joe that has to go. It's the entire system that has to go. Any system that would allow such atrocities and such devilry to, a ha to happen and would support it, such a system does not deserve to exist on God's earth. Okay. And so when these... F um, you know what? I support that guy's right to say this. The price... Um, the price for free speech is free speech. This is America. We are a democracy. I believe in free speech. He can say that. Um, I do believe that the CIA is probably going to come knocking on his door. So are the feds. Uh, but this is the beauty of America. You can live in America and shout death to America. Uh, to my um, friends who have left the Middle East and moved to America and have moved to Europe. Europe's dealing with this problem right now. I encourage you to go back to your country and shout those exact same things to the country you came from. I would wonder what happened in Palestine if you said that to the people of Hamas. I would wonder what happened if you said that if you lived in Syria. I would wonder if you said that to the Taliban if you lived in Afghanistan. Um, Bassem Youssef said that he can't go back to Egypt because he criticized the government. They will kill you in the country that you came from, but you come to America and you come to Europe and you, or you try to assimilate to Western values and you shit on them. Um, I, just said over the, I just went over the numbers before, yes, America gives money to Israel. But they're also the leading provider of aid to Gaza. What you choose to do with the money is up to you. Follow the money. Um, what we're going to see right now in 2024 is a lot of bluster, a lot of conversations, a lot of things are going to be said in Michigan. There you go right there. The leading, show the top stat right there. Uh, this is who funds the Palestinians. Top of the list is the United States. So to my friend who's calling for the death of America, we are also the one funding the Palestinians. 
The difference between Israel and the Palestinians, because of Hamas, is Israel uses their money to create economic growth for their people, and they built a iron dome to prevent missiles from flying to their country. Um, the people of Gaza have been hijacked by Hamas, and they use their money to build terror networks, buy bombs, and provide terrorist network to their people. I ask you, what would you choose if you lived in that region? I choose the money, not the death. Um, what we're going to see over the next couple months, there's going to be the uh, Democratic um, National Convention that's going to be in Chicago this year. Expect riots. Expect people being fucking pissed at Genocide Joe. We'll see if he caves. Nancy Pelosi has called for uh, ending uh, funding to Israel. This was someone who stood steadfast with Israel for four decades, now calling um, to end um, funding to Israel. The Democratic Party has made a hard left. They are aligning themselves with the people of Michigan that are calling for the death of America, the death of Israel, to win votes. Meanwhile, what happens if you continue condemning genocide Joe? Well, let me tell you what's going to happen. Donald Trump is going to win this election, and believe me, he has no sympathy for terrorism. He's aligned himself with the America First agenda. He will eliminate Hamas. He is friends with Netanyahu. He is friends with the Saudis. Um, that is not who you want to be your president um, to my people who support Hamas. We'll see what happens with that. By the way, Kamala Harris is as today meeting with the relatives of the American citizens who are being held hostage in Gaza. So... Republicans have coalesced around Israel, and uh, Democrats have um, embraced many of the people of uh, Hamas. Show this one stat of Gen Z, um, if, you, if you can show that, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Gen Z. Um, Gen Z wants no part of Biden, Biden's unceasing support of Israel's civilian deaths uh, in Gaza Mount. Uh, what happens is this. If you're 35 plus, you are very pro-Israel. If you're under 30, um, you are very anti-Israel. 65 plus, 81% support Israel. 50 to 64, 56%. The lower you go, the less people that will support it. There's one more stat out there. I think I sent you, um, was it um, Gallup? Was it data? See so if you can pull that up real quick and then we'll end this. Um, the younger you are, the more empathy you have for what's going on in Gaza, and I totally understand that. Yeah. So you can pull that up in a second. So um, here's where we're going with this. This is going to be a lingering issue. This is not going away. Uh, we'll see if the ceasefire start, stops um, or continues. But again, uh, here it is right here. If you want to read this, I can't really see it. Go ahead. Uh, changes in favorable, uh, favorable ratings for Israel and Palestinian Authority by H. Uh, 18 to 34, uh, they're less favorable this year than last year. It was at 64% people that okay. were pro-Palestine, and now it's at 38, 35 to 54. It also went down from 66 to 55%, and 55 plus stays stable in their support to, to the Palestinian Got it. So the older you are, the more that you empathize with Israel. The younger you are, the more that you empathize with Gaza. Yep. Um, all right, we've got to wrap up. Where do we go from here? It's been six months yeah. um, of intense suffering on both sides. Um, both sides have, uh, of the conflict have experienced collective trauma that I'd wish upon nobody that will affect generations to come. Um, here's what I'll tell my Israeli friends. You're losing the PR campaign, guys. Um, you need to win the hearts and minds of the world. Um, you have every right to go in and defend yourself. But as Joe... Biden said it's been over the top. Many people believe that. Here's the issue that Israel is facing. For many years, they were the underdog. In 1948, they were the underdog. They were attacked. They won. In 1967, they were the underdog. They were attacked. They won. In 1970s, they were the underdog. They were attacked. They won. In 2024, you are no longer the underdog. People don't view Israel as the victims anymore. People don't remember the Holocaust. People don't remember that six million Jews were sent to gas chambers and the concentration camps. People don't remember that. People see what's going on in Gaza and say they're the ones that are suffering. So you have to understand that times have changed. Uh, Israel, 
the Jewish people have done very well for themselves because they don't view themselves as victims. Um, they don't play that game. They succeed wherever they go. They found a home in Israel, and they're not going to let that go. They found a home in the United States, the two biggest locations where Jews are located. They've thrived. Israel needs to win the narrative because they're no longer the underdog, guys. Um, the Palestinians are the underdogs. Um, how long will this war go on? Here's what I'll say. There's two, every, each side, we talked about the hostages and the demands. Here's what Israel wants. Israel wants a guarantee of safety and security. They don't want to be fun, fighting wars the rest of their life. The, pa the Palestinians want dignity and respect, but first they need humanitarian aid. Um, the extremists got to go on both sides. On the Palestinian side, Hamas needs to go. On the extremist side of Israel, calling for the death and destruction of Gaza. You guys, the world is not supporting that. The Palestinians have the right to exist, especially free from Hamas. Uh, the extremists need to go. The synergists need to step up. The moderates need to step up. People need more conversations. Um, unifiers need to show up, and people need to work together to end this conflict, or else we'll be doing this forever. Um, here's my prediction, though. Uh, there's no appetite in Israel for a two-state solution. Um, I, the last time that uh, the Palestinians offered a two-state solution was under Yasser Arafat. He came back. He pulled the rug. There's, there's been nothing offered ever since. When you call for uh, the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. What does that mean? They want it all. So here's what I'll tell you. The moderates need to step up. People that want to see both sides exist need to step up. The extremists need to go away. Um, or else both sides could potentially go away forever. Um, this is a very sensitive topic. I empathize with both sides. I, I let off at the top that I am pro-Israel, but you can be pro-Israel and pro-Palestinian at the same time. I hope, I pray, I wish for Palestine. You could be the Singapore of the Middle East. You're on the Mediterranean. You could be what UAE is. You could be Dubai if you want it. But if you elect Hamas and continue down this terrorist destruction path, you're going to get what's coming to you, and that's unfortunate. I hope that both sides can work out a conflict and I both, so both sides can agree to a ceasefire. We'll see what happens in the coming days. I'll be sure to cover it for you. Let me know your comments. Give me your hate comments. Give me your like comments. Tell me you love me. Tell me you hate me. I don't fucking care. I'd like to see an end to this conflict. We'll see what happens. I'm out. Have a great day. <laughs>